chapter 5. I'm going to start with verse 1. This is what it says. It says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Verse 6 says, When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea. And drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled. And they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. Verse 15. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray and I ask that you would have your way in this service. I pray that you would speak through me tonight, Father. I pray that you would open up the ears to everyone that will hear it, God. Open up their spiritual ears that they may hear through the Spirit. Open up their spiritual eyes that they may see through the Spirit. Speak to each and every single one that is in here tonight, Father. And tell them what they need to know, God. And God, I give you all the praise, honor, and glory. And in Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk from the subject just for a few hours. <laughs> he is on the scene. He is on the scene. Well, what's taking place here in Mark chapter 5 is there is a demon possessed man in the city of the Gadarenes and or the area of the Gadarenes and um, he's he's going crazy. The, he's being tormented by demonic spirits and they're just driving him crazy. The Bible tells us in, in, in one passage and another gospel that they tried putting clothes on him and he, he couldn't keep clothes on. He would just rip the clothes off of him and he, had, he would stay naked. And the Bible says that he didn't live in a home like a normal person, but he dwelled in the tombs. He lived with the dead people. He would go into tombs and sleep. And the Bible says that he would climb up on rocks and howl like a dog. He would act like an animal. The Bible says that these demons would torment him so bad that he would take sharp rocks. He would cut himself and make him cause uh, self-inflicting injuries to himself. And the Bible says that he had gotten so bad that he started to torment the people of that area. He was driving the people in that city, in that region crazy. They were scared to go in his direction. 
They were scared to go anywhere near him. Scared that he may kill them or scared that he may hurt them because, because he was so possessed. He was so ate up with demons and evil and, and crazy that the people were afraid to, to let their kids walk in that direction. They were afraid to let their animals wander off in that direction because they didn't know what this man was actually capable of. They were so afraid of him that some men in this city, the Bible says, goes up there and they put chains on his hand and they put chains on his feet so that he wouldn't be able to run around and just do whatever. And the Bible says that he would take them chains and he would just rip them off of him because he had supernatural strength from the demonic forces that were living inside of him. He would just rip the... I know this sounds... I know this is real... Um. Brutal. It, uh, the people don't preach this anymore in the church. We don't talk about the demonic realm in the church. And, 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 and I want to get on my soapbox just for a minute. It needs to be talked about more in the church because we're living in a time where Christian people don't believe in the demonic realm anymore. We're letting our kids watch whatever. We're letting them read whatever. We're letting them get involved in whatever because we don't understand that there is a demonic kingdom out there and they are going to war every day over our children and over our and over our sons and over our daughters and over our grandchildren. And but there is a demonic force out there, and when people get possessed by it, they don't act like humans, they act like animals. And there's nothing you can do for somebody that is demon possessed. There's nothing that you can do. You see, we try to medicate devils, and we try to lock devils in cages, and we try to do this to the demonic possessed people and we try to do that and maybe they need a therapist and maybe they just need some more Prozac thrown their way or maybe they need this or maybe they need that let me tell you what the demon possessed people need they need deliverance and the only thing that can bring deliverance is a man named Jesus Christ but this this city had done everything they know to do they done it all they, they chain him up and he just ripped the chains off and they had tried everything. Have you ever been in a place in your life where nothing's going right? Everything's falling apart. You don't, you don't know what left is anymore. You don't know where right is or where up or down is. Everything's just, everything that can go bad is going bad. And you've thrown money at it. You've thrown prayers at it. You've fasted all you can fast. You've done all you can do. And nothing seems to change. Nothing seems to change. Uh, some of us got kids that we whoop and whoop and whoop and we ground them and we ground them and we ground them and nothing seems to change. Nothing happens. Nothing, nothing's any different. And there was the same thing with this man. Now, y'all don't go off and say, Justin called my child demon-possessed. <laughs> Lord, that ain't what I'm saying. I'm trying to relate this to our lives. Because you know what? These people in this city were being tormented by, by, thi by this man's demons. And you see, although we, don't, we may not have someone demon possessed at our home, we are tormented by spirits that are attached to things in our home and spirits that are trying to infiltrate our homes. And, and we've done everything we know to do. And nothing seems to work. Nothing seems to work. But then all of a sudden the Bible says that a man came across the sea. He gets in a boat and he goes across the sea. And, and in one gospel the Bible says as his feet hit the shore, as he stepped out on the dry land, the man seen him from afar and ran to him, fell down at his feet and began to worship you see, once we've done all that we can do and nothing works, we must come to the realization the only thing that is going to change the situation is when Jesus gets on the scene. When He steps out onto the scene, nothing can no longer stay the same. Everything begins to change and everything 
starts to become different. And sometimes it doesn't happen overnight. But little by little we will begin to see things get into line. And things to get in, get in order. All because one man steps on the scene. When Jesus gets on the scene... He doesn't just put things in order, but he, th he brings everything that is attached to him with him on the scene. Yeah. He brings it all. If it's salvation that people are needing, he brings it. Um, when he spoke to Moses at the burning bush, he said, Moses asked him, he said, who are you? Who am I going to tell them sent me? And when, it, when, when Moses asked him this question, he said one simple phrase. He said, I am that I am. When he was telling Moses, what he was telling Moses is do not worry about the obstacles that lay in wait for you on this journey. I am on the scene. And whatever I, whatever it is that you need, I will be. And you see, Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, Pharaoh, let my people go. But the Bible says Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Pharaoh had a hardened heart and he didn't want to let them go. So Moses probably thought, my goodness, you told me to go and ask him to let my people go just for him to shoot me down and tell me no. But God said, I am what I am. Do not worry, Moses. The I am is on the scene. And Pharaoh's heart may be hard now, but I'm sending some plagues Pharaoh's way. And if this don't humble him down, and this or this will humble him down, this will get the job done. And the Bible says plague after plague comes to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh finally says, just get them out of here. They're causing too much trouble. They're causing too much chaos. Let them go. The Bible says that Moses starts taking the children of Israel out and, and as, he, as he begins on his journey to the promised land, he comes to another obstacle. And this is where we get to the Red Sea. And the Bible says that when they get to the Red Sea, Pharaoh has already changed his mind. He don't want them to go. He says, I'm coming after them and I'm taking them back into captivity. Moses says, what do I do? God said, I am that I am and I am on the scene. Moses stretched forth to a staff. He stretches forth his staff. They split the sea. They walk across. They get over into the wilderness and they start getting thirsty and they don't got anything to drink and they're starting to fear for their life because they think they're going to thirst to death. They think they're going to be in dehydration. I feel the power of God right now. There's some people that's been in this house and they think they're going to die from spiritual dehydration. You ain't felt God in a long time. But I'm here to tell you tonight somebody needs to hear me. God said I Moses speak to that rock You talk to that rock And see if water don't flow from it I am on the scene They get hungry Is there any hungry folks in the building Is there anybody in here That's hungry for a word They're wanting God to speak something into their life And God told Moses Again do not worry I am on the scene And manna starts falling from the sky And gives them something to eat Somebody needs to give God a hand cup of praise to be on the sea. And he's working for your behalf. He's working on your behalf. They got tired of eating manna. <laughs> they said, we ain't eating no more manna. We ain't eating this no more. We want some meat. <laughs> Moses says, what, I'm, what am I going to do? God said, I'm on the scene, Moses. And he starts making... Birds fall from the sky. Yeah. <laughs> Gave them quail to eat. The birds start falling. They start cooking them up and eating them. And time after time after time, Moses seen that God was on the scene. Abraham... Abraham, everybody remember the story of Abraham? Abraham prayed for a son and prayed for a son and prayed for a son. And the Bible says that in his late years, God spoke to him and said, Abraham, now that nobody's expecting you to be blessed. 
Somebody hear that. Now that you're up at a point in time in your play and your life, nobody's expecting you to be blessed. Yeah. Nobody is expecting. You may tell you something, church. I'm gonna prophesy to me and to everybody in here right now. Nobody's expecting this group of people to be blessed. Ain't nobody expecting House of the Promise to grow and be anything. Nobody's expecting House of the Promise. You do not have a pastor that everybody knows. Nobody knows my name. Nobody knows where I came from. Ain't nobody ever heard me preach except for very few. And I like it that way because when Abraham wasn't supposed to be blessed, God blessed him in his late years. When he was over a hundred years old, he opens up the barren womb of Sarah and he blesses her with a child named Isaac. Because God stepped onto the scene. I want to tell you, I don't preach to fill seats. I preach to fill a kingdom. I preach to fill heaven one day. I pray that when I get to heaven, I'm able to look out and see thousands of people that have come to the Lord all because of maybe it's one word that I spoke. But let me tell you something. If I never get to a thousand, if I just get to meet one person that come into the kingdom because of something I said or because of something I prayed, I will rejoice all the more. And Abraham was so happy. Not that he had a 20 kids, not that he had five kids. He was happy for the one son he had named Isaac. Named Isaac. And Isaac gets a little older. And then what does God tell Abraham to do? He says, Abraham, I want you to take Isaac up to the mountain. And I want you to sacrifice him to me. I want you to sacrifice him. That's what he said. He said, take Isaac up to the mountain. Build an altar. Lay him on the altar and kill him. And give him back to me. And Abraham, I try to explain that camping trip to your son. Daddy, where are we going? We're going camping. Where are we going camping? Up on this mountain. Why are we going up there? Uh... But Abraham didn't stumble. Abraham didn't bat an eye. He said, the Lord. He said, we're going up here to sacrifice an offering unto God. And Isaac looked at Abraham and he said, but daddy, where is the offering? And Abraham didn't bat an eyelash. He didn't stutter and try to figure out what he was going to tell his son. He said, do not worry, my son Isaac. God will provide the sacrifice. He gave you to me and I know that you're mine and God ain't going to take you away. I'm going on faith and I'm going believing that even if I kill you, He will raise you back from the dead. I'm not going to waver just because of one little thing. The enemy tries to plant inside my head. The Bible says, oh my God, the Bible says that Abraham and Isaac Get up there to that mountain. He ties Isaac up. He lays him on the altar. He's got the knife drew back. And he's about to kill his own son. And an angel of the Lord stops him. And says look over in them bushes. And there was a ram. And there Abraham said Jehovah Jireh. My God the provider. I said he provided. And he provided. I want to tell somebody tonight. The provider is on the scene. He's on the scene. If you need provision tonight, he's here. If you need bills paid, he's here. If you need uh, help provided, provided here, he's here. He is on the scene. And he is the provider. He is Jehovah Jireh. The provider. He is the provider. The woman with the issue of blood. She had tried everything. Oh, don't you love the Bible? The Bible gets humans. <laughs> it gets us humans. Because you see, the Bible don't even tell us this woman's name. It just tells us her problem. And see, a lot of times, we identify people with their problem. Yeah. I'm going to use my wife. She used to go around when she was little. She'd, somebody, she'd see somebody out there look like they ain't had a bath in forever. Ain't got no teeth. I mean, I mean, seriously. And she said, oh my goodness, they look like a crackhead. That's what she'd say. That's what she'd say. My wife, she said, they look like a crackhead. 
But it wasn't until someone in her family got on crack and got strung out on crack that she no longer goes around saying this one looks like a crackhead and that one looks like a crackhead and that that's a crackhead and that's a crackhead. She don't do that no more because she knows from personal experience about the detrimental things that it brings, the anxiety it brings, the depression it brings, the oppression it brings when it's somebody you love that is strung out on crack. But you see, it's human nature to identify people with their problem. With their problem. And here's another woman that is only identified as her problem. We call her the woman with the issue of blood. We ought not call her that no more because she no longer had an issue with blood. She had tried everything. She had went to doctor after doctor. The Bible said she had spent every dime she had trying to find a cure for this um, problem that she was having. And, and she tried everything and nothing had worked. But then a man named Jesus starts passing through her city. She catches an eye. Catches out of the corner of her eye. The man named Jesus that she heard can heal anybody from anything. See, in these days, when you had that type of problem, you were not supposed to go around people. They thought it was contagious. They thought you might could catch this. So what she would have to do is she would have to walk the streets away from everybody. And when somebody started to get too close, she would have to start screaming out, Unclean! 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 In other words, get away from me. I've got an issue of blood and you don't need to be around me because you could possibly catch what I got and the Bible tells us though that when the crowd the crowds thronging Jesus Jesus has got tons of people around him a multitude of people around him and they're all over him and they're bumping into him and they're crashing into him and they're grabbing on him because everybody just wants to touch the man that they believe is the Messiah but then the woman of the issue of blood catches him out the corner of her eye and she says I'm not going hollering unclean if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I believe I'll be healed. I believe I'll be healed. The Bible says she fights her way through the multitude. She reaches out and just grabs the bottom part of his robe. Mm. I wish I had my prayer cloth up here because on what you don't know <laughs> on that prayer cloth it, um, what, what, what Jesus would have wore he would have been wearing one and it, and it drapes over their head and it goes all the way down to the feet and at the feet it's got little tassels tied on it and the Bible and there's 52 of them all the way around and what it represents is the promises of God in those tassels is represented and so when the Bible says that she touched the hem of his garment, she didn't just touch the bottom stitch. She grabbed a hold of the promise of God. Somebody needs to hear that. She grabbed a hold of the promises of God. And when she grabbed it, Jesus turned around and he said, Somebody touched me. Who touched me? The disciples say, Lord, what do you mean who touched you? There's people all over you touching you and grabbing you. But he said, no, this was different for I felt virtue run out of me. Somebody touched me with faith. You see, it's one thing to get a hold of God, but it's another thing to get a hold of Him with faith. She gets a hold of Him with faith. He turns around and finds the woman knelt down. He looks at her and he says, Woman, your faith has made you whole. You have been made whole because of your faith. You see, you can try doctors and you can try medication. You can have surgeries. You can have this and you can have that. But nothing makes you whole like when Jesus steps on the scene. He steps on the scene. To Abraham, he was the provider. To the woman with the issue of blood, the healer. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, I got so many. Oh, yeah, this is a good one. Mm. There's a woman <laughs> that we believe was Mary Magdalene, and she's committing adultery. She's caught red handed in the act of adultery. They grab her, they drag her, they throw her out in the street. And, 
And they say, the law says, they go and they hunt Jesus down. You know, this, this man that's running around preaching all this mercy and grace and love and how God's a loving God and, and he's running around forgiving people. You see, we had already seen the paralyzed man drop down and he said, you're saved. Your sins have been forgiven. And we've been asking, who is this man that can forgive sins? Is he calling himself God? He blasphemes. So we go and we find this woman caught red handed in the act of adultery I got one question for you why didn't they grab the man and throw him out in the street I'll just leave that right there but they grab the woman they throw her out in the street and the Bible says they go and they get Jesus and they said the law of Moses said she's to be stoned the Bible says that Jesus kneels down in the dirt and begins to write I don't know what he was writing I think it was the ten commandments I think he knelt down there and started writing out all ten commandments in the dirt. And he looks at them and he says, You without sin cast the first stone. The Bible says that when he spoke it, they dropped their stones and left because none of them was perfect. But the only perfect one in the group walks over to the woman and he... Come on, somebody. He shows her grace. He showed her forgiveness. For Abraham, he was the provider. For the woman with the issue of blood, the healer. But to Mary Magdalene, he was the God of grace. He was the God of mercy. Can I tell you, I've met the God of grace. I've met the God of mercy. I deserve to be hung on a cross and tied to a whipping post. But I don't got to because a man named Jesus looked down. And had grace. He said, Mercy on me. And he said, I'll bear the sins yes. for this one. Hallelujah. I'll be the sacrifice for this one. For Mary Magdalene, he was grace. She was going to be stoned. She was going to be killed. But grace arrived on the scene. You got Saul. I'm just going to tell a couple stories if that's okay. You got Saul going out killing Christians and he believes he's doing an act of service for God. Saul thought he was in right standing. Taking Christians and killing them. Taking Christians and throwing them in jail. Doing all these things. But Saul is on his way to Damascus to put the final nail in the coffin for the church. But on, that, on his way there, the Bible says a bright light appears, knocks Paul down on his backside, and blinds him. He can't see. Mm, I think it's so cool, I think it's so awesome that Jesus found it fitting to blind him naturally since he was already blind spiritually. He says, you, you've been blind for so long, Saul, spiritually. If you don't want to use the eyes that I gave you and that I put inside that head, I'll just take them from you. Yeah. <laughs> Blinds him. And Saul says, Lord, what would you have me to do? Jesus says, he says, who art thou, Lord? That's what he says. He said, I'm Jesus. Whom you persecute. I'm the one you're going around locking everybody up for serving. I'm the one you're killing everybody yeah. for following. Amen. I'm that man. He says, what would you have me to do? He says, go on into Damascus. There's going to be a man there by the name of Ananias. Go and find him and he'll give you your sight back. But you will no longer persecute the church. You're going to join the church. You're going to be yes. the apostle for the church. You're going to go around this world building churches and planting churches and spreading my word. He gets out there and the Bible says Ananias touches him. And it's like scales fall off his eyes. Yep. God was showing us in the natural what he had done to Saul in the spiritual. Yep. He had opened up his spiritual eyes. So, so for Abraham, he was the provider. The woman of issue of blood, the healer. Mary Magdalene, he was grace and mercy. But for Saul, he was revelation. He was revelation for Saul. 
Saul was blind until Revelation stepped on the scene. He stepped onto the scene. You see, Jesus Christ, God Almighty, the Holy Ghost, whatever you, whatever title you want to use, yes, they're three entities, but they're all wrapped in the same garment. Amen? He, he, he shows up. When He shows up on the scene, He brings whatever it is that we need. Whatever it is that we need. He said, I am that I am. It means I will be or I shall be. And you can try everything. But until he steps on the scene, yeah. nothing will truly ever be different. Right. Last one, I promise. Book of Esther. This is where I'm, I'm getting ready to preach now. Book of Esther. <coughs> Believe it or not, the book of Esther is one of the most Debated and questionable books in the entire Bible. Let me say that again. The book of Esther is one of the most questioned and debated yeah. books in the entire Bible. They, theologians, it's been questioned so much that theologians even get together and debate whether it should be in the Bible or not. And here's the reason why you think the book of Esther... Why the book of Esther? Why should we take that book out? Why, why, should, why is that the most questioned book? Why is that the most controversial book? And it's for one reason. And the reason is, nowhere in the book of Esther can you find God, His name. His name is nowhere to be found in the entire book of Esther. God is not mentioned a single time. But the evidence of Him being there is from the beginning of the book all the way to the end. You can find His fingerprints everywhere through the entire book of Esther, but His name is not mentioned. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's easy to have faith when God is the main character in the story. It's easy to have faith in what you're praying for when everywhere you're looking, there's His name. And there's His name. And there's His name. It's easy to have faith when we see God in everything and, and when we can see Him working here and we can see Him there. But it's, kind, it's a little more difficult when He's still on the scene, but He's working behind the scene. Yeah. When he's, when he's controlling the lights. Yeah. When he's the one holding the boom mic. When he's the one behind the camera. See, we all want God to play the main character. So that everywhere we look, there he is. And we see what he's doing. And we love the God that's got all the dialogue. And he's in every scene. And he's in on every set. But we, we have a little bit more of a difficult time when he's behind the scenes. When His name isn't being mentioned a whole lot. When we're praying for a lost loved one and the name's not coming up in their life a lot. They're not speaking the name we want to hear them speak a lot. They're not crying out to that name that they did the drama to. That name that's above every name. We love that scripture. We love the scripture that says um, that Jesus Christ is the name above every name. He is the King of kings and the Lord of Lords. We love that scripture. We love quoting where Isaiah said, I am God and there is no God above me and no God beside me. We love those scriptures. We love the scriptures that say, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me but not, but don't let us talk about it is blessed is the man that falls into diverse temptation blessed is the man that's been pressed down persecuted but not destroyed don't talk about those scriptures why because those are the times that Jesus is working behind the scenes behind the scenes he's still on the scene but he's behind the scenes He's behind the scenes. When we're, when we're in a storm and we don't understand the storm and we don't think God's going to deliver us from the storm and we're saying, where is He? Yeah. 
He's on the scene. Yes, he He's just in the bottom of the boat asleep. <laughs> when, when we're toiling with the waves and toiling with the wind and we're saying, where is he? Is he going to let us die? He's on the scene. He's just walking on the water. When we're about to be tossed into a fire, killed, destroyed, and that's going to be the end of it. We're saying, where is he? He's on the scene, but he's already in the fire waiting for you to get there. When our ship wrecks on Malta and we don't even know where we are, we don't even speak the language of the people there. We're not even on the same uh, language. When there's a language barrier, I, I swear when I'm talking to my kids, it's like I'm speaking gibberish. I'm saying sit down. They think rolling. I'm saying be quiet. Ada heard scream. We're going to eat in a minute. That means to them we're never eating again. <laughs> I'll get you juice in a second. I'm going to thirst to death. There's a language barrier. And I think I'm going to go crazy sometimes. And I'm saying, God, where are you? Where is this patience that you speak of? Where is this peace that you're talking about? And he's saying, I'm on the scene. I'm just behind the scene. But I want to tell you, if you ever watch a movie and you, all those names at the end of the movie where the screen goes black and it begins to roll, the credits, you see the main character and you see the protagonist, you see the antagonist, you see all the extras and all their names come across. But there's one name that always gets overlooked. But the movie would have never been put together. The characters would have never been in place. The, the, the people wouldn't have known what to say. The cameras would have never been cut on. The lights would have never been right. The sound would have never worked if it wasn't for the producer. And the producer on this scene, his name is Jesus. And when those end credits roll, his name will be mentioned. You need to be encouraged tonight that he is on the scene. He's on the scene. He may be behind the scene. But nothing is going to work unless he's on the scene. Unless he's on the scene. Hallelujah. But this is the thing that I love about Jesus is that he never comes on a scene that he's not been invited to. He won't. He won't come onto a scene that he's not invited to. He has to be asked to come. James chapter 4 and verse 2, it says this. It says a lot of things, but the last thing that verse 2 says is this. He says, you have not because you ask not. You want me on the scene? You've got to invite me on the scene. Invite me into your heart. Let me be the producer of your life. What does a producer do? A producer tells you what to do, when to do it. Excuse me. What to say and when to say it. How to act and when to act that way. The producer controls everything. And if you don't do it right, he'll make you do it again. Do I got any people in here that's been through the trial twice? Oh, yeah. Because you didn't do it right the first time? The producer at the end of the scene said, cut. Said, let's run it back. Five, four, three, two, one, action. Yeah. <laughs> He's the producer in my life. And he's on the scene. And everywhere I go, he follows me onto that scene. And onto the next scene. And onto the next scene. Sometimes we can invite him into our lives, but still control what scenes he gets to go on. You can help out on this one, but leave that one to me. I want him on every scene. I want him on every set. You can stand all over the house.
I want every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. I want him on the scene in my life. I want him on the scene in my life. If you want Jesus Christ on the scene of your life, and you're saying today is the day that I, that I invite him into my heart. Today is the day I invite him into my life to be on the scene. I want him to control every aspect of my life. I've tried controlling it. I've tried working it on my own. And it hasn't been working. Let's let him rule. Let's let him reign. If that's you this morning, slip up your hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I see him. I see him. I see him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you this morning. If you're in here and you know that there's a scene out there, you've got it in your heart, but there's some there's some places in your life you're still trying to control. You just ain't fully let go of and you're saying today's the day I give it to you God slip up your hand slip up your hand amen I see them I see them I see them hallelujah hallelujah lift up your hands everybody all over the house I pray over every heart and every mind of the people's hands that are lifted Father we want you on the scene we want you on the scene. We've tried everything. We've went in every direction. We've done everything that we know to do. But God, we're trying you now. Do what only you can. Do God things. Do God things. Because you're the only God that can. We praise you. We worship you. Hey guys, I hope today's message has encouraged you and has built your faith because our Bibles tell us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And I pray that we've placed the seed of faith inside of you today. Um, if there's uh, anything that you would like to request prayer for or anything like that, you can always go to our website at houseofthepromisechurch.com. Go to the link that says prayer request and send in any prayer request that you may have. But I want to take just for a few minutes and pray with you guys that the Holy Spirit would just continue to lead you and guide you and direct you in the way that you should go. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray right now and we ask that any situation, any circumstance that anybody may be facing right now, God, God, I pray that you would intervene like only you can, God. I pray that your healing power, God, would go forth and touch them that are sick. Your delivering power would go forth and free them that are in captivity and save those that are lost, God. God, we give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching and be blessed.